the future. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming the patient of the future, e-patient Dave. What a thrill. Thank you so much, Gunther. Thank you for your vision. Uh, the people, people who don't know the healthcare world are stunned when I tell them that a patient is giving the opening ad address at a conference like this. And for those of you who don't know, uh, I don't know how much of Gunther's history you know, but he was one of the original visionaries who did the initial bit of research that in a sense opened up the whole world of participatory medicine because a number of years ago, concerned about the question of the danger of going out and Googling, because we all know those garbage out there, he researched it and for years tried to find a single case of death by Googling. And he didn't find it and he published that result. He even added a bounty after a few years of failure. And that is a seminal moment, a vital piece of information in the e-patient white paper that I'll talk about briefly. So the title of this talk is indeed, and this was proposed, as Gunther says, just uh, in April when that whole Google Health story hit, give me my damn data. Uh, and the subtitle was going to be because you can't be trusted with it. Uh, but I toned it down a little because I, oh, this is being broadcast, isn't it? Oh, well. <laughs> Participatory medicine. The uh, nice looking guy there, who somebody thought that was clip art, but no, that's Tom Ferguson, the guy who founded the e-patient movement and became an e-patient himself uh, uh, in his later years. Uh, and his movement has now become the Society for Participatory Medicine, which has just launched uh, this year, uh, participatorymedicine.org. We're not really active on Twitter yet but the uh, address will be S4PM. And aren't you glad we didn't spell out at participatory medicine? Don't, I just hate long Twitter names. Foundation principles. I take this very seriously. Gunther told you a little bit about my story, but my one story doesn't change the world. Uh, as I've gotten involved in this, you know, I sort of, I found myself uh, as Gunther said, uh, asking myself, um, what am I going to do with this free replay in life? And I've, I found this calling to healthcare. And as I started studying it, I've only been at this for a year and a half. Uh, the first session I went to, a little high tech conference outside Boston, I found uh, when my turn came to talk, I said, the thing I want us to shift here is that patient is not a third person word. All right, we talk about patients as if it's somebody who's not here in the room right now. Well, trust me, your time will come, right? And I went on, went on at some length about that. The next thing that came up, I went to a privacy meeting in Washington discussing the, the issues, the HIPAA, the data privacy and things. We have so many obstructive regulations in place that it interferes with the right of a desperate person to try to save themselves. Privacy takes on a whole different meaning. Data security takes on a whole different meaning when your life is at stake. I mean, look at it this way, you know, we take our pants off for the doctor. Why wouldn't we share information to save our lives? And then the right to know what your options are. This is important with social networking. And ultimately, when necessary, the right to pick up your data and pursue an option elsewhere. Like, you know what? This isn't working here, I wanna to go to this other hospital, give me my data. Realities that we deal with. Technological innovation can vastly alter things. iPods, cell phones, computers, you name it. But healthcare is in many ways far behind other industries, and yet the good news is it ain't rocket science, right? The tools are available, technologies are available, we just need to start doing this. And honestly, I'm becoming impatient with the slow rate of change. Quick review of my story. I had a sore shoulder at the time of my physical three years ago and I went in and got a shoulder x-ray. Now those of you who know how to look at x-rays will say, will see that there's something there, that shadow that shouldn't be there. Totally by coincidence, the shoulder x-ray picked up a golf ball sized lesion in my lung that happened to be near the shoulder. That 
shoulder x-ray saved my life because I didn't have any physical symptoms until six months, uh, six weeks later, and by then it would have been too late. So what it was, ultimately we found, was kidney cancer that had spread all through my body. Um, and it was, I mean, I, I, was, I was near the end. As I researched, I've always been a Googler, so I, as I like to say, I Googled my butt off, and this happens to be the website, a, a graphic from the website of the treatment that I got, which was high dose of interleukin. And indeed, in every one of those spots, I had a tumor. I had one in my skull, numerous ones throughout my lungs. The one in the femur there was big enough that eventually the leg broke. I now have a nice steel leg. That's a pretty big metastasis when it breaks your leg, right? So here are the others, and there was one in my ulna. When the leg was in the process of breaking, I couldn't use a regular walker because it put too much stress on the ulna, which also had a metastasis in it. And finally, one in my thigh muscle and then my tongue itself. That's a gross thing. I'm glad that happened just before the treatment started because it pretty quickly uh, fell off then. It's sobering. I mean, I've always been somebody, whether it's computer software or car research or anything, I don't do well with being told you can't do that. I just find ways around things. Well, so every place I looked, what I read was things like this. The prognosis is poor. Almost all patients with stage four renal cell cancer are incurable. And I remember the night that the biopsy finally confirmed uh, the diagnosis and that I, you know, I'd read 24 weeks. Now, this was in January. Uh, and uh, so, I, like, what came to mind, I remember waking up at 1 o'clock one morning and just seeing the, I might not see Christmas, okay? Um, I probably won't see my daughter's wedding. Um, I actually had the image of seeing my mother's face at my funeral. And I, I faced, sorry, I faced the task of sitting with my daughter and her boyfriend and giving them the news and telling them that they had better not get married prematurely just so they could do it while I was alive. So then, um, uh, um, so you're left with the, the question, what are my options? What can I do? Right? How can I get myself in gear? So you get engaged, you do everything you can. First thing I did, this is patient site, my hospital's personal health record system. It is ugly and really needs a makeover and everything, but you know what? I could look at my data and I could give the password to other people so they could look at it and give me uh, advice and feedback as well. Second thing I did, I joined ACOR. I have this I love this phrase, my doctor prescribed ACOR. He handed me a prescription slip with ACOR.org written on it. And you know, what I found there was more useful, action-worthy information from other patients than I found on any encyclopedia-style website. Encyclopedia-style websites could give me peer-reviewed information that was 10 years out of date and could not tell me anything about what the treatments were really going to be like. Patient communities are responsive, people discuss what to do, and patients know what patients want to talk about. And consider this, we talk about referral delays reaching a doctor. Well, I got responses in four minutes and 11 minutes to my first questions in the patient community. This is an appeal I always toss out. Whatever we do in healthcare spending, if we could just devote 1% of it to helping, to funding patient communities, to let patients do uh, what they see is necessary. And for those of us who think about how hard it is to get physicians to adopt medical record systems, consider down at the bottom, this is an audience where you don't have to motivate adoption. These people are already motivated and engaged. And then finally, uh, a social support network. Now, long story short, because I have other things I want to get onto, the treatment worked. This is, surprise, surprise, and I make sure I get copies of all my, my scan images. There's one of the lesions on the left side before. That I mean, if you consider the size of my cross section, cross, uh, my, my midsection, that's a pretty good size tumor that was there. And that little white dot is what was left of it 50 weeks later. And the tumors have con continued to shrink 
uh, and the ones that remain are still, are, have, I'm sorry, have been stable 